Hey everyone, Malio here. Last year, I made a video discussing the process that went into manipulating two Mega Rush drops from two specific fights in the sewers. Overall, it came down to a 1 in 46,000 likelihood of getting two Mega Rushes to appear in battle, as the randomness for both battles is determined at the same time when the room loads. Luckily, through the extensive effort of JD Aster and Trivial171, we were able to reverse engineer this process and produce two successful Mega Rushes by wasting only two tenths of a second. This video showed some pretty interesting applications of number theory, and I'm glad it was so well received. Well, I hope you're ready to take some more school notes, because today, instead of number theory, we're going to be talking about calculus. Specifically, there's a useful application of calculus in trying to optimize a small portion of the TTYD task. If you aren't aware of what a tool-assisted speedrun is, be sure to check out taskvideos.org to learn more information. Basically, it's a demonstration of what a perfect speedrun could look like, performed by slowing down the game and rewinding time over and over again until sections are seemingly perfect. Well, thanks to Isaac Newton, the Paper Mario TTYD task is just a bit more optimal. So, let's derive how we got to this point. So let's first set up the problem. The first thing I need to discuss is speed swapping. In this game, Mario's up and down movement is faster than his left and right movement. We believe the developers designed Mario's movement this way in order to make his overall movement look more uniform due to the way the camera is positioned. Mario's up and down speed is 2.6775, whereas his left and right movement is 2.25. If you walk diagonally, it'll give him a value somewhere in between these two speeds. Another way of looking at his speed is that Mario walks 19% faster up and down compared to left and right. Speed swapping is a trick that allows Mario to maintain this 19% faster speed while moving in any direction, including left and right. If you move up or down for one frame, and then jump on the next frame, then Mario will maintain his faster moving speed of 2.6775 and as long as you continue to do frame-perfect jumps back-to-back, -back, you'll retain this faster movement speed. Next, let's talk about wall boosts. In this game, pushing at a slight angle against walls actually causes Mario to gain an additional bit of horizontal speed, leading to a speed of 2.79 while speed swapping, which is an increase of 4.2% over just speed swapping normally. So basically, for every half second, I save one frame while wall pushing over just speed swapping normally. Now, let's say that I want to push against a wall below Mario while moving to the right. Well, after testing a bunch of different inputs, we found the definitive best angle on the analog stick to push against the wall at was 255,79, which looks like this. As you can see, it's a pretty slight diagonal input, yet it manages to maximize our horizontal movement speed. Remember that input, 255,79. I'll be bringing it up later. Now the final component of the problem, the scenario in which we have a problem. This problem can apply to one of the rooms in the Rogueport sewers, specifically sublevel 3, which is to the right of the blue warp pipe rooms. In this scenario, Mario comes out of the pipe in the top left corner of the room. By the end of this upper hallway, Mario needs to be in the bottom right corner to optimally make it around the turn to go to the path below. Now that we know about both speed swapping and wall boosting, What's the optimal path for Mario to take? Well, if you paid any attention in school, then you'll know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but there's a problem with that. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's, it's wrong to apply it in this situation. We don't care about distance, we care about time. Rather than find a solution that gets to the destination in the shortest distance possible, we need a solution that gets us to the destination in the shortest time possible, so let's get to work. Before I get started, I'd like to give a big thanks to Tas Plasma for his help. He's a longtime friend of mine, and you might recognize his name from when he helped commentate our Mario Kart Wii Task Block showcase at Summer Games Done Quick 2019. Tas Plasma was a big help when discussing this problem and helping to turn it into a viable equation. We know that Mario is some distance Y above the wall and we know that the length of the hallway is some distance x. We can start by assuming that the hallway is long enough such that it's faster to wall push for some duration, rather than take a direct path to the destination. 
Therefore, we'll have two different paths to take, which I'll draw like this, and we can give them arbitrary lengths L1 and L2. So L1 will represent the path Mario takes while speed swapping towards the wall, and L2 will represent the path Mario takes while pushing against the wall. Next, we can associate these two paths with their corresponding speeds. We know L1 is just Mario speed swapping normally, so he'll be moving at a speed of 2.6775, or I'll just call it V1 for simplicity for now. For L2, we know he'll be wall boosting with a speed of 2.79, and we'll just call that V2 for now. And just so that I don't get yelled at by anyone in the comments, let's add units too. Now, let's talk about time, specifically the time it will take to traverse both L1 and L2. Well, while we're traveling a distance of L1, we are traveling at a rate of V1 units per frame, and while we're traveling a distance of L2, we're traveling at a rate of V2 units per frame. If we sum the two, then we have a function of the total time spent in order to reach the destination. Okay, well, we can't do a whole lot with this, especially since we don't know what L1 and L2 are. So, let's rewrite it using some of the other terms somehow. Let's take a step back and think about what exactly we're trying to find. I mean, yes, we're trying to find the shortest path to take, but specifically, we're trying to find what angle of approach towards the wall leads to the fastest outcome. So, what we're really trying to solve for is this angle theta. Let's rewrite L1 and L2 in terms of theta. Using some trigonometry, we know that the cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent side, which is y, divided by the length of the hypotenuse, which is L1. Rearranging this, we get that L1 is equal to y divided by cosine theta, or just y times secant theta. And let's substitute that in. Now, finding L2 is going to take an extra step. We first need to find the length of the base of the triangle. First, we know that the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side, which is the base of the triangle, times the adjacent side, which is y. Thus, we can rearrange this as y times the tangent of theta. To find L2, we then have to take x minus the base of the triangle, so we get x minus y times tangent theta. Thus, we now have an equation for time as a function of the angle theta. So, how do we find the point at which time is lowest? This is a great example of a calculus optimization problem, which aims to find the largest or smallest value that a function can take. In our particular scenario, we'll be trying to find the smallest value since we want to minimize time. How do we solve these types of problems? We find the derivative, which is a super fancy way of saying the function that represents the slope or rate of change of the original function. We want to take the time equation and see where its rate of change stops, meaning it has either reached a maximum value or a minimum value. By taking the derivative, we find that the rate of change for this time equation is y divided by v1 times secant theta tangent theta minus y divided by v2 times secant squared theta. Again, we want to look for the minimum value of the original time equation, so we set the derivative equal to zero since a derivative value of zero means that the original function stopped increasing or decreasing. We can simplify things a bit, a little more, once more, and we're good. We end up with sine theta is equal to v1 divided by v2. Then we can just take the inverse sine of both sides, and we're left with theta is equal to inverse sine of v1 over v2. Now, let's just pause for a second and just admire this. We had one gigantic messy time equation, and the result is this simple. So there's a few things to take note of. Nowhere in this result is the length of the hallway or Mario's distance above the wall taken into account. More importantly, this shows that the angle we find will hold true no matter how long the hallway is, nor how far above the wall Mario is. With the end in sight, let's plug in our speed values. We take 2.6775 divided by 2.79, and then take the inverse sine to get 73.674 degrees, though we have to adjust this angle real quick. So the game sets Mario's walking angle as 0 when he walks upwards, 90 when he walks right, and 180 when he walks down. So what we really want to find is this angle here. We can find this simply by doing 180 degrees minus 73.674 degrees to get 106.326 degrees. 
The last step is converting this into an actual GameCube controller analog stick input. A while ago, I made a script that brute force all 65,536 theoretical GameCube controller analog stick inputs, which resulted in a list of 1700 distinct angles in TTYD. From this list, we can find the angle closest to 106.326. The closest angle is 106.348495 with corresponding analog stick input 255,79, which looks like this. Wait a sec, this looks kind of familiar. This is exactly identical to the optimal analog stick angle for wall boosting, either by sheer coincidence or something, I'm not really sure. What I do know is that through the use of calculus, we were able to conclude what the fastest movement for this section of the task is. This is a really tiny example of a real world applica- uh, I guess this isn't the real world. Uh, general application of calculus for something you'd see outside of just calc class. More importantly, I really just wanted to make this video to show you all that there can be more to tool-assisted speedruns than just playing the game in slow motion. There are a bunch of other things you can do externally that can lead to optimizations that would have otherwise not been provably optimal. Even if you hate calculus with all your heart, I hope that this video was bearable and that you followed everything. Thanks again to Tas Plasma for his tremendous help, and lastly, thanks for watching.